bunch of seaweed I filled in a bathtub and it was filled with water and 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 the cannabis plant, this plants were loving it but it was like uh, very stinky and so this this guy I met at the fairy congress he ran one time came to my house and he sees my my fertilizer operation and because I was also throwing all sorts of other random scraps so I would make hash throw my hash making residues so I'd make juice oh throw my juicing residue oh I'm going to pee in it, you know, I'm going to add some fire ash to it, you know, and so it's just this crazy thing I, in a bathtub that I had. And, and, and so this guy comes to my house and he tells me, you know, if you go grab a handful of the soil from underneath an elderberry, it's going to have the odor eating microbes. And so it worked a little bit, but then fast forward a couple years. I'd bought uh, some IBC totes off a blueberry farmer, uh, organic blueberry farmer, so they've been filled with fish emulsion or vinegar, and I was going to fill all of them with seaweed and other things and start my fertilizer company, right? But then I realized, though, actually I can't start a seaweed fertilizer company, but I have all these totes. So the one I did have full of seaweed and fish carcasses that made some potent fertilizer but smelled really bad, I started learning then about this Korean natural farming and from Gil Karandang's page, which had this hybrid style and based out of the Philippines of, of Japanese and Korean natural farming. And I learned about uh, some probiotic farming that this guy was spreading from um, Northern California. That's a Bokashi maker. And so literally I had this stinking fermenting tank going on of seaweed and I took some human grade probiotic capsules emptied them out into it and it did eat the smell and so then I was like okay that was like further okay I, I I'm, I'm starting to believe in this stuff this is great you know I, I made some compost teas I composted my whole life and I was like no I think there's there's some some something in here and so then I got to where I found the copy online of, of Cho's Global Natural Farming and I was like this is alchemy this is this is like the greatest shit ever because all of a sudden you know I can go take all these things that are weeds and and I'm gonna have to remove and, and either compost or burn and I can turn them into my fermented fertilizers and I saw it as just on this alchemical level how we can you know just pass on the things that we we, we need and and, the, and capture fertility because I was really inspired by biodynamics but I never have had the opportunity to go bury some cow horns. Yeah. But there, there is very similar. It, it, and you're burying those, those and making those preparations. You are capturing indigenous microorganisms. And you're and and the homeopathic application is somewhat similar to the Korean natural farming. But yeah, like I said, no one ever like took me under their wing, and, and so so instead I went and created what I call permadynamic bioculture. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I do really value. The, the notions they have of the farm as a living organism. And so why we need to have these closed loops. And so like I said, my own personal vision for a natural farming based out of the bioregion of Cascadia is truly bioregional, that we don't have to rely on imported ingredients from other places. Now this year, you know, I'm gonna still probably be using some sugar in my preparations. Um, I do make a liquid culture. This book, for instance, um, explain. So, so this guy, he, he ends up, t he had a falling out with his dad, Master Cho, talked a bunch of shit for 20 years. And uh, basically part of it is because if you're using sugar or molasses like the EM1 users do, you are going to be favoring acidic bacteria and fungus. And now naturally you go into the fungus, uh, you know, look at the soil food web over there. Doug fir is going to have a pretty acidic soil. Mushrooms secrete a lot of acids to chelate uh, ions out of the minerals. And so, so naturally fungus are going to be creating an acidic soil. But what was the innovation from the Jadam organization or, you know, the idea they stole and repackaged, however the history gets <laughs> written, is that if you use a simple starch source, such as a boiled potato or oats, you will end up, instead of having a, something like uh, EM1, a lactic acid dominant you know, thing that is at a pH of 3.5 and shelf stable for possibly years, you make a very quick brewing, non-aerated compost tea. So in, in the genome system, I really like this because we'll go around and uh, go into a healthy, undisturbed ecosystem and get some leaf litter. Uh, so just under the actual, like, like still, like, 
visible leaves and get down to that black loamy soil. And so, you know, again, it's like 50,000 species of microbes in one teaspoon of soil is the common thing passed around. And because in a healthy ecosystem, 40% of the photosynthesis is getting sent down to the roots to ta tailor its microbial connection to, to, uh, to the soil food web. So seasonally from the same tree, you would get different microbes if you went to that same maple tree every time because the root exudates are tailoring the microbes they need at that time. And I think it's called rhizophagy because they, they're finally finding actually the roots swallow the bacteria and some will make it back out, but some then get digested. And that is actually how the plants are getting the, the fed. They're eating the, the bacteria and the fungus. And so um, in the Jadam system, what we're doing is we're, 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 we would create a basically unaerated compost tea, but you'll take like a five gallon bucket or a 50 gallon barrel and you'll take a handful of the leaf litter and put it in a sock and you have like a stick at, across the top and you put a rock in the sock so it's it's sinking into the water but still tied and suspended at the top you do that same thing with either like oats or, or taro or sweet potato uh and so then those simple food sources uh unlike the 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 you know more simpler broken down molasses or sugars will then feed and and maintain everything at a ph of seven but then the thing is and this is the most common mistake i've told that recipe to a bunch of people where they're like i let it sit for a month and it stunk i don't know why you like do you think it's like no i told you to do it for two or three days and it's very similar to brewing beer what happens is and especially if you have to do it about above 65 degrees for actually getting visible uh things happening but what happens is you'll watch the foaming action start of, of the digestion of the nutrients and then actually it develops a current and the ring will be circulating and then when it starts to stick to the sides and is no longer circulating that's when everything is starting to eat each other so again in this you know sort of second generation nature farming system it's about maintaining the diversity of of the, the micro life so we're always trying to capture things but not let them continue to homogenize until you're just left with like nematodes or protozoa could you could you inoc inoculate biochar with this oh yeah stuff? no people do people do for okay. sure but uh yeah and so then so then the last two years my big trip is actually then just getting more because i've been brewing Actually, my, so my, my buddy over there, he's the first that really got me to ever enjoy a beer because he made it and I was like, this actually tastes good. And so, uh, I started brewing some wine maybe 11 years ago and then I started brewing mead about eight, nine years ago and I've gotten really into cider because I've gotten this whole crazy endemic microbiome, uh, you know, farm as a living organism going on. And so my wild yeast over the years has just gotten more and more palatable. I noticed when I first started doing wild fermentation, it was just hit or miss. It'd be like, yeah, but yeah, generally, you know, too, too acidic. And then the more that lactic acid bacteria dominates, it's like less likely to get the acetic bacteria to that are more spoilage microbes or whatever. And so, yeah, so understanding Bokashi and its relation to things like silage or understanding how the Jadam microorganism solution is similar to brewing like a fast acting like beer or, or young wine. Uh, you know, EM1, again, it's all, it's all filled with generally recognized as safe microbes by the, the FDA. So that's cool. It's like, you know, if you have people who are really kind of germaphobes, you can try and weed them into this and be like, well, start with some EM1. They even sell a, a pasteurized version of this for human consumption that's full of enzymes and antioxidants still. But yeah, it's, it's uh, that's kind of the gist of it. I mean, there's, there's some more fine tuning, but a recipe book yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's yeah. being okay. passed it was being passed around okay right yeah. <laughs> and also okay so um i did make a website that does have some manuals on it uh that were open source actually for instance i had this on my website last year because i saw it so many places on the internet but i was formally contacted that we're selling this book on amazon take it off you know but uh the apnan manual which is the em1 users manual um uh the chose global natural farming put together by a lady from india those are all open source so i have about five six things that are you know no so far no one else has told me to take them off my website Which but website? my website i made two years ago is called cascadian natural farming.org there's uh, a lot of links like there's not too much on there because it's like well if you go to youtube and search these preparations you can find 
hours and hours of people like Chris Trump or Eric Wiener who have studied with Master Cho for like 10 years, gone to Korea several times, and, and they have explained every single step of the process. So I'm like, I don't need to necessarily make some YouTube videos myself and, and talking about this. But I have links to their websites. I have links to uh, Cho's Global Natural Farming India, you know, links to all, just all sorts of things. I do have some files uploaded there. There is a little uh, section explaining just at least the acronyms, what they, the, the, you know, what they are, FPJ, fermented plant juice, IMO, indigenous microorganisms, labs, lactic acid bacteria serum. Uh, there's a water soluble calcium that can be made by soaking charred eggshells in vinegar. That's technically not uh, available if you want to be, uh, if you want to have organic certification because calcium acetate is technically synthetic, but um, it is under petition right now because other people make calcium acetate by soaking like limestone in vinegar and you get the exact same thing. You could soak oyster shells in vinegar, anything you can use. So, so the acetylization, you know, creates the calcium acetate from whatever calcium carbonate. Um, they'll also do a calcium phosphate that they extract by uh, animal bones. And then another very common uh, natural farming preparation is uh, amino acids, uh, fish amino acids, or you can make it out of mongoose. Uh, j j uh, Thailand, they have snails this big, so they, they, they just half weight sugar to whatever animal carcass you're trying to decompose. And you can throw in a handful of the IMO brand or pour some of the lactic acid bacteria serum if it starts to smell a little funky and it'll help. Again, a sugar cap on top helps keep uh, some foliage molds from forming. That will get eaten, so you kind of got to check it periodically. But that stuff, that's basically, like, I know people that put it in their dinner because it's just, it's, it's, this, it's, it's the exact same thing. They're replacing uh, salt-based fermentation for fish paste with sugar. With the sugar base, up to two years. Up to two. Yeah, years. that's that, that's when your you... nitrogen fertilizer, but then it's also going to be because fish put swimming in the ocean and their gills are going to have lots of the uh, purple non-sulfur bacteria in them. So there would be purple non-sulfur bacteria in your fish amino acids. Oh, uh, I was I was referring also oh, the, to the, your like your oh, rose. The, the rose. And that's sugar. a one week. That's one week, and then you strain it. And then what people are doing with the leftover solids, because there's still so much sugar stuck to it, is what they'll do is uh, they'll they'll let it turn into a, a weak alcohol, but by you know just pouring on some water and then making a vinegar from it. Because a, a lot of the the Korean natural, I, I I hope not to. I'm not trying to explain so much Korean natural farming, but just natural farming as a whole. Because the fact is, there is all like a lot of teachers that. Are, have like, oh, I, I, I'm level three and, and, you know, they're way dialed into one specific dogmatic system and I'm not a dogmatic person. So I'm, I'm just, I'm more like systems analysis. And so I was just, like I said, it's like, there's a lot of genesis of the history of fermentation and the history of, of agriculture. It used to be people, if they grew food, how do you store the food, you know? And so this is where you just gotta, you know, send out your tentacles in, in all directions and then try to just like bring back all the knowledge and then apply all the knowledge within all the knowledge to see how it all fits together. <laughs> so I have a winery and when I get through making wine, I have a lot of sludge left over, which is dead yeast cells. What yeah. should I be doing with that? I've been pouring it back on the base of my um, vines. There is some somewhere I have... Uh, Anyway, yeast is supposed to really help with like the branching uh, and, and node production. Uh, I do have something where I wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, possibly. I think that, I read that the other day that that's actually cream of tartar. No, that's different. That's different. The cream of tartar titrates okay. out of, of wine that has tartaric acid and forms crystals at the bottom that taste like alum. But it's not the same as the stuff that settles so, to the bottom of the jar. Saccharomyces cerevisiae can live in aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions. So it's what we call a facultative microbe. And um, what the addition of live or dead yeast to fertilized soil substantially uh, showed in, in a study was that it substantially increases the nitrogen and, and phosphorus content of the roots and shoots of plants. Yeast additions to soils also uh, increase the root to shoot ratios. And so that's why even uh, Fungi Perfecti's MycoGrow product actually contains Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So it is, yeah, like look at the whole history of sourdough starters, silage, kimchi, sauerkraut, brewing, making fermented fish paste, all these things that have helped sustain our species to get to where we are dumb enough to kill ourselves off now. 
it comes from just this shared, you know, like way of thinking that it's like, how did the first yogurt happen? Well, I guess someone put some milk in like a, a cow stomach and it wasn't that clean. And so then it curdled. And so that's how we get now we have cheese. We have yogurt, you know, because just these different microbes at different times. Humans were like had these aha moments. And so <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yeast and fungi are, are strongly related to each other. Well, yeast is a fungi. Yeast right. is not a mushroom. Yeast, uh, some yeast can spread by hyphae, like candida. Actually, when it takes over body, it's actually getting to that hyphal level instead of just doing what Saccharomyces yeast is doing, which is uh, what my, my mitosis, where it's splitting. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, so Saccharomyces is a budding yeast, but then we have some yeasts that are, you know, able to do both fungal hyphal, uh, method of reproduction as well as then the spore budding but yeah saccharomyces specifically then is a spore budding uh, fungus but so yeah all yeast are fungus but not all, and all not all fungus are, are mushrooms okay <laughs> anyway yeah still a uh, little bit of time left maybe I don't know anyone keeping track of time it's three? Okay, so I guess I could try to go for another half an hour, but like, what would people like to hear about? Wait, how do they remediate toxins? How do the microbes digest and remediate toxins? Okay, in some instances, uh, it's like, they're at least like locking them out of the soil. Like say there's like mercury contamination or something. They wouldn't necessarily uh, be able to, they wouldn't be like necessarily able to to take them out of the soil, but they're able to lock them up and maybe bond them into a different ionic form, you know? So, cause you got cations and anions, so they could possibly at least, you know, bond it with some other elements. So it's, it's more stabilized and not going, going to be, uh, you know, being uptaken into the food or flushing in further downstream or something. So if we take some of these and like, there's a Creek near my house and this Creek is on the, uh, downside of a lot of lawns that are all perfectly green and mm -hmm. in mode so toxic city so is it worth it to take things like this and throw them in there it's knowing a band-aid you know it's, gonna, it's like it's gonna keep flowing it's right? better than nothing okay. <laughs> maybe keep making keep throwing like uh so on the the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization website, they do actually have a study showing that blah 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 this is really not that effective but that's because if the pollution's still happening, what 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 what's well like, what, what can we do about it? Like we can be monkey wrenchers. We can be like Edward Abbey, but did, I don't know. Did, he just wrote about in fiction like taking out the dams. Did he ever actually blow up a dam with a houseboat? I don't. Know. <laughs> we got. <laughs> I came late. What are these? So this is bokashi mud balls. And so bokashi is a Japanese term meaning fermented compost. Uh, it comes from the very similar traditions of uh, fermenting rice for making sake or the Korean version of rice wine, which is called makgyoli. Um, and so in 2001, there was a sustained cleanup effort of Japan's inland sea, and this was one of the techniques that was developed. They're pouring lots of liquid culture straight into river systems, and they were able to clean up this and, and restart a uh, near dead ocean estuary system. And so, so, and there's been like probably close to 10 million of these thrown in the waterways worldwide. So we have a, a, a problem with some of the lakes in the area here where there's a algae bloom that mm -hmm. happens in the summer. So you can't swim there. You can't fish there, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So um, this could be a solution to that problem. Um, and, and would you be using this same kind of method of making these balls? Yeah. I mean, this, that's one. Yeah. Bokashi. I mean, Bokashi sells for like $20 a pound if you go buy it from someone on the West Coast that's making it and like has it in a garden store. But yeah, it costs like less than a dollar a pound to make it yourself like a 50 pound bag of wheat mill run was like 12 bucks making your own inoculate that's maybe in another couple bucks of, of raw materials and so then the, you know dig up the soil for free and you're even supposed to do about a 10 to 1 ratio of the bokashi to the clay soil but in terms of weight we were probably pretty close to at least like six to one or something and uh i did it on fidalgo island as just kind of like gorilla bio remediation because 
there was a huge algae problem on, on Heart Lake in the Anacortes City Forest Lands. And so they brought out, you know, and uh, it was it was a milfoil and an algae. So then they just chemically nuked it. And like, you know, all the fish are dead, like when they did Lake Erie in Lake Campbell a few years earlier before that. And these are fit lakes that are stocked with fish. So they're like, oh, whatever. But I mean, me, I like these places. So uh, what I did is I, I went around to the seven lakes on Fidalgo Island uh, with backpacks and just do a little like, oh, walk around with like 50 to 100 in my backpack every little ways, throw a ball in, throw a ball in. You're, you can do like they're saying for waterways, you can do about one of these every meter squared. So, but I mean, in a lot of other places in the world, we're really lucky because somehow or other, steel came last to no the Northwest. So like man's hands have, have touched this place not as harshly as other lands. So, so like, okay, for instance, 1988, when Fukuoka came over here for a permaculture conversion, I think it was 1988 when it was Olympia permaculture conversion. Anyway, I was, that was when I was born, so I don't know. But they took Fukuoka to the Olympic National Park, and he, he said this was the most alive place he'd ever been on the planet. And he traveled to Africa, he traveled to, to Japan, or Thailand, yeah, he traveled to India, and, and of course, people have been in these places a lot longer. So, I mean, yes, colonialism and, and, and most of us being settlers here, it's a very complicated scenario, but I mean, I'm just, I just got to have gratitude not for so much like the privilege of being like colonial de settler descent, but just for being in the place where steel came last in the world. That's basically like why I feel like there's just still so much life in this ecosystem. Just because like, yeah, there's still mad clear cutting and then they're aerial spraying with like glyphosate like things over the replantings. But at the same time, the life force is strong here. <laughs> and so this is where like, you know, whether you're talking about like chi or or like microbes it's like you can feel that presence when you're in an old growth forest like and so the older a tree is the actual more diversity of the microbes at the roots so that's where yeah i like to go find the biggest dug fir biggest maple I've, I've played around with trying to isolate the u microbes those were kind of weird madrona microbes seem like they are maybe a little more specific to the madrona i hear that's why they're really hard to transplant but like Elderberry, like I said, someone told me years ago about how the root exudates uh, of elderberry, because it's so fast growing, have a really nice microbiome at its uh, soil food web level. And so, yeah, hawthorn, you know, all these sort of trees, they're going to have sort of different things. So I've tried to also like, oh, I'm going to specifically make a, a liquid microbe solution for um, for some apple trees. So I'm going to go specifically get some hawthorn soil. Why? Hawthorn, you don't see anthracnose around, right? You, do, you like So uh, anthracnose is a really bad uh, fungal lesion on uh, fruit trees in this area and more than anywhere else in the world. But at the same time, let's, let's look at what's in the rose family that also is resistant. And so similarly, like uh, I heard old folk wisdom when I was explaining all these processes to someone, it's like, oh yeah, the old timer said, go get some, some huckleberry soil and sprinkle it around your blueberries. So at the same time, some people are worried about like, oh, my, 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 my garden could be filled with pests from the outside world. And other people are like, no, 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 I'm going to get the probiotics from the outside world to bring to my garden. Because like, where's like a lot of private land was the land that was clear cut like five times before then being sold. So it's like we're having to deal with yeah, a whole planet that needs a lot of this stuff. And so if you can find your cheaply available resources and turn them into fertilizers and kind of try to close the loop, not have to rely on imported fertilizers or imported microbes, that is in essence a large part of what nature farming is. What, what kind of like, uh, so I have like a little uh, uh, quarter acre farm and, mm -hmm. and I'd like to uh, use some of these methods uh, to increase the the microbes in the soil what's like a simple really simple solution so, that so i could the, use the simplest thing i did recently because i found this beautiful mycelium in, the, in some soil that was just like i like came out in bricks when i was digging a hole i was like Kugh! i was like whoa and it was in a really dry spot of the property right in front of my greenhouse but it was where the runoff from my greenhouse happened so i'm like oh yeah so already these are all the microbes i've been harvesting that found a new home and so i did what uh I didn't do the rice ball bearing method. I'm like, well, if I buried a rice ball in that area, the rice being a different food source is going to change whatever relationship this is. So I did the simplest method, which as is talked about uh, in Master Cho's Janong book. And uh, I took just like chunks of these mycelium and I took about uh, a 
50 pound bag of oats and 25 pound bag of rice bran and just broke the mycelium up in it got it to a water ratio very similar to this where it can like hold a little bit of shape but come crumble apart easily and then within a few days because i started out when it was more cooler weather um it didn't get hot but then it did do exactly like when i'd done the rice ball culture and so then you have to turn it once a day for about a week because you, you, un, unlike compost thermophilic composting where you're like oh yeah we get it up to these high temperatures to kill all the unwanted things it's like no 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 we want to keep in bokashi imo composting the temperature is under 140 even 120 preferably and so then you know when you're first breaking it up uh, you'll see a lot of, of you know fuzz on the top because you keep it covered with some straw or stuff so there's not direct light and mixing it on the forest floor to invite more of the local native microbes into it and then um, yeah and, and I, in a week I had this beautiful thing that I'd added fire ash to and seaweed and then I'd been covering it with nettles and comfrey leaves and then those got mixed into it and then I was like oh screen some rock dust from a gravel pile that a well had been drilled because I'm like that's all a bunch of basalt and serpentine so like I mean and that's what the, the bedrock of the property is so I was like there's everything that's been eroding so anyway this is a really great way like uh, someone mentioned biochar earlier that is often used people will make all sorts of amendments so um for instance there's one guy who uh does a bokashi that's called grokashi and and it's even like it's in the ace hardware in anacortis now which is really funny he helped create this system called probiotic farming which uh, originally was called anaerobic uh anaerobic hydroponics with probiotics so they're doing um uh they're using a reservoir that instead of a planter pot with holes in the bottom they're using a reservoir that they fill with the em1 solution so the the facultative anaerobes keep it from going septic and so then the plant's roots can go into this reservoir and grow like four times faster without all the water runoff or the evaporation so it's really funny to see this thing where it's like this prepackaged thing i watched this forum on the internet develop called the probiotic wellness garden that is the sub-irrigated planter system uh, EM1 Malibu biodynamic compost and then this grow Kashi and his grow Kashi he call he's, he he calls like the best Bokashi on the planet because his amendments or his, his he does five times the amount of EM1 because uh, he wants to specifically those microbes right but then he adds some beet juice so then that's going to have some wild microbes in the raw beet juice and then he adds azomite powder for minerals and then he likes to add vitamineral green so <laughs> so instant for instance when i made this this uh, batch of bokashi i actually had some crazy ayurvedic supplement of like like 50 different plants that was some super sugary syrup like like thing and i added some of that to it i'm like oh whatever you know get the good stuff going but yeah, so so you can tailor it. You, yeah, there's there's a lot. If you look in the Apnan manual, it, it talks about like six different methods. Uh, here's the Bokashi from Myanmar. Here's the Bokashi from Nepal. Here's aerobic Bokashi. Here's anaerobic Bokashi. So there's a lot of variants. And then I'd be spreading that as a compost. Yeah, on about my, like a half soils. inch thick uh -huh. around. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you can ferment it and try it to get rid of it. <laughs> Good luck. I mean, if, if it's like, for instance, some, some, some people are saying for, for weed suppression, like buttercup, you know, besides the, the fact that there may be provide like over time, they'll provide the minerals that then allow, you know, they're just a successional pioneer plant. And eventually as they decompose, they'll return the minerals to the soil to provide for the next thing to take over that needed what they were doing. Um, one idea is that if you change the, this is like coming a lot from Elaine Ingham. If you change the fungal to bacterial ratios in the soil, you have less weed problems because the weeds prefer bacterially dominant soil and like brassicas for instance have no mycorrhizal relationships whatsoever and so they are a bacterially dominant species but if you look at brassica in the wild it's a basically a weed right and so we've just domesticated wild mustard into all its different forms but so we look at the pioneer species and they're coming into the disturbed areas where the fungus haven't had a chance to establish themselves so over time if you're trying to get to like this point where it's a no-till heavily mulch sort of ecosystem and establish those fungal relationships in the soil over time eventually you should see less of what we call weeds oh oh club root oh that's what you're See, I'm, I've never experienced that, so. But yeah, no, okay, for instance, la lactic acid bacteria would possibly help because it is a very anti-pathogenic. Uh, well, it's like if we look at like all the sort of things, like why do mushrooms produce antibiotics? Competition. They're discouraging others from eating their food. 
So that's why we find penicillium in mold, or penicillin in penicillium mold. It's because it's like, at that level, it's like, yeah, there is a lot of like cooperation and collaboration going on, but sometimes it's like, no, this is mine, you know? <laughs> is there anyone who's like expanding on or like developing the idea, like using these fermentative techniques for the bioremediation because i've just like heard it randomly here and there but um well I, I, like this will all if you do this sort of thing in your garden you are going to be spreading it downstream right. but this is where I, I feel like the japanese having created this idea of em mud balls and then now there's world mud ball day which is august 8th so everyone could <laughs> could be doing this you know and and start making their own bokashi for mud ball, world mud ball day and uh that's where I found this is like pretty much it's, it's like the most inspiring thing I've ever read about. I just learned in another workshop that there is a bacterial, um, uh, a bunch of different bacteria that were created to digest uh, petroleum products like oils, yeah, like yeah, similar yeah. to oyster mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I have heard of people like sprinkling either bokashi or, or like liquid IMO cultures over like uh, where they'd been changing oil on their driveway and, and literally Petroleum is really not that hard to degrade. Like it, it, it's a big boogeyman of our time, but like for instance, 2010 the BP oil disaster mm -hmm. was not nearly as bad as predicted because there was a simultaneous bloom of oil degrading hydrocarbon eating uh, bacteria. Um, the probiotic uh, Grow Kashi Probiotic Farmers Alliance yeah. is the Facebook group that yeah. has all of that information. Oh, yeah. A lot of it's pot. Uh, growers oh, no. trying to get information. I joined it with 800 people. But their whole thing is like how to not buy more soil and replace it, but create live probiotic beds even in your hoop houses that will become richer each year. And um, I wanted to ask you about uh, biochar. A lot of people say that biochar can actually be um, detrimental to your soil because it it's like a sponge, it. so it'll soak everything yeah. up. So unless That's why you, you charge it, it for like two weeks or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people people will introduce it in the IMO stage. Or, or their Bokashi. I mean, IMO, Bokashi, it's like whatever, same difference. You know, it just depends on what, what your sources are. But it's all, all this information is, is coming from a same lineage of, of, you know, ancient China, ancient Japan, ancient Korea. No, biochar just will suck cations. It, yeah, it needs to be charged because it's so porous, it wants to bond with all these, these uh, easily exchangeable ions. So it will literally suck, just like if you were to bury wood chips into your soil and till them in instead of mulching them on top, it will suck out the nitrogen out of soil or other available, easily soluble elements. So that's why it has to be mixed into compost or peed on or, or soaked in a liquid uh, nutrient tea or something. So then those ions get saturated and, and, and the pores then, you know, are full. So when they they go into the soil, they they already are just, you know, seeping stuff out more than taking it in. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. What if, um, oh, you go ahead. So do you have any um, formulas for um, bioremediation internally? Oh yeah, no, no, okay, so so all the Korean natural farming preparations, for instance, are used in their animal farming and, and for humans. I know lots of people who drink the lactic acid bacteria serum. Somewhere around here I passed around a fermented flower juice of roses, and uh, I don't know, oh good. <laughs> yeah, so anyone who hasn't tried it, and if their hands are reasonably clean, not like mine, uh, stick your finger in it, and, and like your finger, and you get this wonderful, magical taste. Is that the same bacteria you find in like yeah, yeah, like, um, like, whatever, if, if you were, didn't get here earlier, look at the, the label and, and, and see all our friends. That's those, all the bacteria in EM1 are FDA generally recognized as safe. So for heavy metals, and it'll, it'll bond with that. So, I don't know, uh, one friend was telling me that the best thing actually taking heavy metals out of your average human these days is parasites, what we call parasites, <laughs> like worms actually are the ones put like if, if you were to do a, a parasite cleanse without having first tried to like eat a bunch of zeolite or bentonite clay that those you you got you got to do the, the the heavy metal cleanse before you do the parasite cleanse because the parasites are actually doing the heavy metal cleanse for us mm. wow that's so. wow. behind you sir <laughs> yep so soil scientists say that if you don't like what you're saying you have to get your compost pile hot, you have to turn it, make it aerobic. And the anaerobic bacteria is garbage, and you ruin everything. So 
why do they say that that those bacteria are, are bad? Like, how do they know? And how is it differ, different? Or how does it differ from the it's just plain, anaer anaerobes that you're getting below the soil? It's just playing it safe. So, so like for instance, not all composts are created equal, right? So, so you're gonna if you're then taking what you call compost and making compost tea, you're gonna have much varied results depending on what your source is. So Elaine Inga, my feel was just playing it safe because just as many aerobic bacteria are pathogens you know, just as many anaerobic bacteria are beneficials. So it's similar to when, like, you're trying to capture a nice forest uh, microbial colony using this buried rice technique. They play it safe by going off their history of fermentation. So if it's a good smell and is a white mold, then that is considered a, a like, A, a, a grade culture. But the stinky stuff above ground is bad because it's it stinks and that's yeah, how you well, and that's just, how you know it's just, it's just, yeah, humans have been led by our noses for so long so it's just because this is all coming from histories of food fermentation all these sort of agricultural techniques of nature farming that then it just it, it's like we do have to trust our gut and we do have to trust our nose for for trying to look at this stuff i just uh, say that um uh, compost piles when they get when they get really hot it's the fire fang, it's the actinomyces, yep. which is also uh, makes a, a white uh, fudge. Yeah, right, but that's a pseudo-hyphae. Actinomyces actually used to be an EM1, but it's they're so ubiquitous everywhere. But actually, the actinomyces is where our great, more antibiotic compounds have come from the actinomyces than any other strain of microbes. Hmm. Uh... So, Would yeah. you extend the life of this Bokashi ball if you like shoved it in a sock boom and put it along the water's edge? Could you get it to like keep dispersing and growing a little at a time, or you just Possibly. plunk them out in the water? I just throw them in the waterways. But um, supposedly, if you inoculate ceramics with the EM microbes, mm. though that's supposed to be much longer. That's where it's like that'll last for years instead of six months. Wow. And fired. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they inoculate it before it's fired, but then they re-soak it afterwards, I think, for the EM ceramics. Can these be used in salt water and fresh water? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay. Even, even we mixed a little salt water in earlier, mm -hmm. so that way there was more minerals for the microbes to feed off of, but then also a greater range of microbial diversity. Uh, are, you, are you saying seawater or salt water? Seawater. Water. Okay, because I would think there would be a big difference. In I mean, water. if if you were far enough inland, it is totally acceptable because uh, fermented seawater is also one of the Korean natural farming preparations. They'll take a uh, fermented plant juice and some of the lactic acid bacteria and add those to uh, seawater at one to thirty dilution, and that's actually used late in the season for uh, sweetening fruits. But uh, yeah, if you're in the middle of the the, the country or uh, some other continent. It's totally acceptable to use uh, some sort of, uh, you know, sea salt. Have you ever used sea salt when you haven't been able to get? No, but see, I, I actually, from the little bit I know about remineralization using the, the ocean, is that the sodium isn't such a bad problem. So things like sea crop C90, they're actually taking the sodium out. But some people are saying actually the sodium might be a really central element that we are actually are missing. But what? it's got some sodium. Oh, okay, okay. I guess I, I'm thinking then uh, C90 has the sodium removed. Sea yeah. crop has some, it does have some sodium. And that was a kind of a concern to some people because they thought, putting sodium on my garden, you know, and, and I thought, well, that's where the minerals are. Yeah. You know, so you want the minerals for yeah, your garden. Sure. So I suppose that would be an adequate substitute then if you didn't have salt water. Yeah. I'm just gonna uh, again. Anyone who has looked at this, uh, they they can kind of look at here. There's two two of the the main nature farming manuals. You got the Cho's Global Natural Farming, and then the EM1 Users Manual. So you can look at what what you can do with the store bought culture, and you can look at what you can do with making your own. And both those are on the internet in many places. But one such place is uh, CascadianNaturalFarming.org. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there you have it. That's pretty much it. I mean